mention them. You can add to them, but I want to suggest you cannot subtract from them. I have only kept the ones that are absolutely said by Jesus. I won't quote Paul, Peter, James, John. I'm not following them. A believer, in what sense we're talking about, is a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's follow him. Let's not follow Nehemiah, Esther, and John, and all. I get kind of concerned about Protestants' view of Catholics and their great concern about Mariolatry. And kind of leaving Jesus in the background. Often the very people that complain about them are guilty of Paulolatry. They wonder, why come we're so big on Paul? I think we ought to be big on both, but I think we ought to be bigger on Jesus Christ. Because without Jesus Christ, Mary and Paul are nothing. And neither are we. Without him, we are absolutely nothing. So let's look to what Jesus said when he was wandering around Galilee with his friends. And not only Peter, James, and John and the eleven, I want to say they weren't the only disciples. There was Joanna, and Mary, and Mary Magdalene, and Susanna. And I want to say that in terms of intimacy, I think they beat us. They were so intimate, they don't have to have their names in print every minute. But when it came to some of the things that Jesus needed to have done, he trusted them. Furthermore, it was those women that supplied the daily need for Jesus and his disciple friends, his men friends, where they went out. Talk about a responsibility and an opportunity and a beautiful thing was the Jesus relationship to those women. And I want to tell you, as far as I can ascertain, when I hear about Abram Brady, who was a tremendous man with whom I labored for years before he died, and I loved him like my own father. There would be no Abram Verady if it wasn't for Marion Johnson, who was an eccentric lady from New York who met Christ. She's the one that had the vision. She's the one that paid the bills. She's the one that prayed for hours. No one remembers her. Behind John Wesley, Martin Luther, and Whitfield, there were some tremendous women not discounting Susanna, his own mother. I'm telling you that this team in Christ, there is no black nor white, rich nor poor, male nor female. We're all one in him. But hear Jesus, and I will comment briefly on what Jesus said. And you'll notice as you go through the Gospels, he always, he said in certain places, if you do not learn a chapter a week from memory, you cannot be my disciple. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. Doss, by the way, it just comes to my mind, used to say, it isn't how much you go through the Bible, it's how much it goes through you. I know a man that can't read or write. He just knows a few verses, but he radiates Jesus Christ. He just knows about like twinkle, twinkle, little star. But he really twinkles. He's got it. But Jesus was walking along one day and he said to his disciples, If any man comes to me and does not put me before father, mother, brother, and sister, and his own life, he can't be my disciple. That's what he said. Now you may be the greatest soul winner, discipler, and friend, and everything else, and I'm not going to explain what it means to you. I can't. I can tell you what it means to me, but I can't tell you what it means to you. But I know this, that if Jesus reigns in your heart, he told us that he would send his Holy Spirit to teach you and bring to your memory what he said. And one of the things he said is, if any man comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, brother, sister, and his own life, he can't be a disciple. So I don't care what other qualifications you have. If you don't do that, you can't be a disciple of Christ. 
You want to be a follower of Christ? Companion of Christ? Friend of Christ? Follower of Christ? If you do everything else and you can't do that, you can't be his disciple. Jesus said that. Jesus said, you have to put me before other people. And you have to put me before yourself. Hitler, that was a demand to be in the Nazi party. You have to put the Nazi party and its objectives ahead of your own life and ahead of other people. I've seen pictures of the young men in the Red Guard, 20 years, 20, 22 years old in China. A table laid out like a butcher table. They would bring in this young man's mother and father, lay her on the table with a basket on the end, he would take an axe and cut her head off. They have to put the purposes of the Red Guard ahead of their father, mother, brother, sister, and their own life. That was a covenant, a pledge. That's what Jesus said. Today, in Los Angeles, in the gangs, you violate the code, you're dead. It's happening every day, today, in this country, this very day, taken right from the scripture. Jesus Christ said, if you do not put me before your father, your mother, and your brother, and your sister, you cannot be my disciple. If you're going to have any movement that moves men and nations, you have to have that kind of commitment. Jesus knew that. That's the way the social order is run. If you don't run it that way, the social order goes into disarray. We start at nine, quit at five, and pay 100000 a year. That isn't the way they worked around Ho Chi Minh. They worked 24 hours a day. They were together when apart. They had a covenant, and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors for the Declaration of Independence. And every man lost his, all 59. All but one lost his life. I think that's the record. That's why we're here. It was a revolution. Jesus Christ is part of a revolution. He's the most revolutionary figure in history. The revolution of love. Jesus Christ said, If you do not put me before father, mother, brother, and sister in your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Christ before others, Christ before self. The Communist Party before others, the Communist Party before self. I heard a speech of Gorbachev in Moscow to 12,000 students from socialist countries that he brought for 10 days to talk to them. Something, can you think of a head of state of any Western country that's done that in your lifetime? Can you think of any head of state like Gaddafi and the president of Tunisia for two weeks? Brought 1,500 of the leading young people of Africa together and spent two weeks with them to discuss the African Revolution. We get a few people that graduate with honors from Yale and Harvard and they pass through, we give them a pen and shake their hand and they go out. No vision, no purpose, no nothing. No national purpose. I could go on, but Gorbachev in his speech, I listened to it to those kids, changed two words and Billy Graham kind of could have signed the talk. I can think of one of the passages, I'll try to quote it for you. He said, the greatest need of the hour is to mobilize the young people of the world, to fight injustice, to help the poor, to fight the future Holocaust due to nuclear arms, to fight for mercy and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's the possibilities of the youth of the world. The only thing he didn't say let's band together around Jesus Christ. What he said, let's band together around Marx and Lenin, and let's do it. And the kids love it. We don't even ask them to give their lives, their fortunes, or their sacred honor. We argue about giving 10% in a gift. 